Anyway, what was your question? Okay, my question is um, about the, the beeps coming, which oh. just happened very recently when I tried to turn on notifications for the calendar with sound, and then um, I turned everything off manually. Okay. And the, it still happens, when, mostly when I type and make mistakes. Yes, I will. Like try to. I will. Um, okay. I will admit some people, and then I'm going to share my screen to show you something. Uh, the trouble is, when okay. I turn on sharing screen, I can't see who's trying to get in. So uh, it's a little bit awkward. Well. Um, pretty. Oh, pretty scene. If you look at on the on your Mac, if you look at uh, where is it now? Accessibility. Where is accessibility? Accessibility. There is a way to oh. um, to turn on and off accessibility, and there are different things that you can do with accessibility. That, among other things. Um, have key, turn on things like key clicks and a bunch of other things. And the way that you trigger that is by repeatedly hitting a particular key and you can change that. So you said that you were repeatedly hitting the delete key and that caused it to turn on. That's probably an right. unusual choice, but I would look at your accessibility settings to see if you might have it turned on. I turn on the accessibility zoom function all the time because it allows me to blow up certain parts of the screen. But um, for things uh -huh. like the key clicks and so on and so forth, I, I gave that up long ago when I stopped using IBM Selectrix. Um, I used to run a newspaper and we had- Well, I, I never had it. Oh, I, I realize that, but you can accidentally turn it on. And when you turn it on, then as you're typing, okay. you get key, key clicks. I'm not saying that's that's absolutely positively what happened, but that's my first guess. Is that um, you turned on the? It's not enabled. Well, there are a lot of different choices under accessibility, and they have. You can have part of it enabled and not realize it. Also, you have there. Are, there are some programs that will ask you if you want to turn on accessibility. If you don't really pay attention to what it's asking you, that program will turn on accessibility even though you have it. And then once it's on, it doesn't go away until you turn it off. But that uh, accessibility function, it's been in the Mac for decades and uh, it's fairly, it's fairly uh, common for people to accidentally turn it on. Um, the other thing to look for is um, also in the uh, system preferences, look under notifications because you might have turned on a, a different type of notification. Uh, notifications, again, is a fairly- I thought I turned, I, yeah, I don't see anything on accessibility keyboard. Um, I, I'm just, that's my, that's my best guess. And the second one is something under notifications. Notifications is also quite compl complicated because lots of things want to notify you. And I regularly have to go through and print it down. Uh, I came in, I'm in one morning and this was right after the uh, political campaigns uh, really got going. And I had 1400 new notifications, which I thought was a bit extreme. Um, but I used to work for the government. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah. I used to work for the government. So pretty much every single political party out there knows who I am. And uh, even though I was a civil servant, the, the list, if you're, in, if you're in government, they publish the list of civil servants. So you're kind of stuck. They know who you are. Um, and even though I'm retired. They also have, list. Yeah. They so also have lists of registered voters. <laughs> oh, yes, they have lists for voters. Um, I, got, I, I got on the Washington State um, uh, lists right after moving back to Washington State. So between that and my my uh, service in the federal government, I, I'm doomed. And everybody everybody can find me. Hey. Hi, Bella. Hi, sweetie. 
Okay, I mean, I have absolutely everything off for notifications that's visible. <sighs> okay, um, then we might have to look for something else, but those are my first two guesses is that it would be notifications or uh, accessibility. And somebody had their hand up. Um, I don't remember. Oh, oh, uh, oh, Rebecca had her hand up. That's not my name. Yeah, it's not my name. I'll have to redo my name. It's because uh, I, uh, I am involved in another account and I keep getting her name. So let me try this one. Okay, there you go. That's me. Um, I, uh, we upgraded to Catalina and um, have had uh, uh, various things that uh, we're not sure what to do about. Um, before we did it, I, I have the cloud for backup and we also did the time machine. Uh, and then I noticed after we did it that one of my files that I use a lot is missing. Um, and uh, so I looked in Time Machine to see, to find it, and it wasn't there. So um, I, I want to know how do I, how do I go into the cloud and find this file? I don't know how to get into the cloud. Well, um, what, what thing do you think is in the cloud? What kind of dot, what kind of item is it? Well, I, well, I, a, a folder, uh, a file with a whole bunch of things in it. Uh, okay, the, um, uh, the easiest way to do that is to, um, oh, somebody is, has that chat function. Uh, I need to turn that on. Um, let me scroll something down here. I'm gonna show the screen again. Um, and because I happen to have Catalina on this machine. And if I open up the Finder, one of the uh, things that I have in the Finder is that I have iCloud Drive, and this iCloud Drive is the cloud. So this is stuff that is in the cloud that is mine, and these are various things that are saved in the cloud. Uh, so that's iCloud Drive, but okay. then I okay. I also have one drive, which is um, Microsoft's um, cloud, and then Adobe's Creative Cloud. But anyway, depending upon how you have your machine set up, these will show up in the Finder window on the right. But a lot of people, they don't, okay. they don't see that uh, sidebar. So you say, hi, sidebar, it doesn't show up, and you don't know that it's over there. So you have to say, show sidebar. And then within the Finder, you need to okay. go to Preferences. And one of the things that you need to check is that under General, have hard disks, external disks, CDs, connected servers, because that will turn on everything so you can actually see it. Because otherwise, the uh, people at Apple like you have a clean desktop, and you may not know that you have that stuff. Um, so that's uh, okay. going on into the Finder Preferences and, and turning on uh, that view allows you to see what's in the cloud. Time Machine, depending upon what it's doing, Time Machine sh will sh stores things that have been um, saved at a particular point in time. So if you had it, if you have it up and running continuously, and this was on your machine six months ago, you should be able to go back in Time Machine to six months ago, and it should show up. Uh, so. You, but you to, it helps if you know where it is located, uh, where were you saving it, because you have to go through and, and find it again, and then have a good idea of when it was there. Um, so if you yeah. think you, if you went back three months, but it was actually six months ago, it may not be there. A lot of people also don't leave Time Machine on all the time. They turn it on and off for reasons that I have no idea. But and if you had it, I know this one gentleman, he says, oh, I do time machine backups all the time. He had turned it off two years earlier and had never turned it back on. <laughs> and his hard drive mm. right, crashed. And so when we went back and we restored from his time machine backup, there had, wasn't anything we got for the past two years because he had turned it off. Uh, so going and checking to make sure that time machine on, is on is a good idea. One of the things you can do is you can, 
as an option, you can go into your Time Machine preferences and tell it to stick an icon in your menu bar. And if you go up to the menu bar and click on it, it'll tell you, is Time Machine backing something up? And when was the last time it backed up? It'll be in your menu bar and you don't really have to go very, look very hard. But a lot of people, for whatever reason, turned it off. Uh, so you want to make sure that Time Machine is on. You want to leave it on all the time. Um, with the very first time you back things up, it'll slow down your network a bit. Uh, it'll slow things down because it's backing everything up. But once it completes that, which will be anywhere from an hour to possibly a day, depending on how, what you're doing, once it completes that, it backs up on the hour and it usually takes just a few seconds to a few minutes, depending upon what it's doing. So it really doesn't slow anything down. But if you turn it off, and you don't have a backup, that can slow you down for months. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I know a guy who ended well, up. Um, we did not use. Yeah, we did not use it until the day before we were going to do the update, and we uh, we you know did the whole computer. I thought, uh, but this one file doesn't seem to be there. Um. If, um, if, if Time Machine was on when that file was existent, it should be in your Time Machine backup someplace. Um, you would think, I looked all over for it. I looked in other files to see if it dropped in someplace else, but I, I can't find it anywhere. So um, yeah. anyway, uh, hopefully this will help finding it in the cloud. Uh, one of the other things that happened was uh, I used OverDrive for uh, uh, downloading uh, audiobooks, and now OverDrive has a big circle with a sort of X through it, um, indicating that I can't use it. Is there anything I can do about that? Um, OverDrive is for podcasts, I think. No, uh, for uh, downloading books, oh, either audio. Audio or oh, e Okay, the uh, the reason why it's got the X through it, it means that it's not 64-bit. Uh, and I would go to uh, to OverDrive and see if they have a 64-bit version. And if they don't, um, I I tend to for for um, for books, I tend to use Kindle and uh, iBooks. For podcasts, I don't do podcasts, but uh, um, I can't remember there. I can't remember what the most popular podcast program for the Mac is because I don't do podcasts. Um, so I'm sorry. I don't. Can I say something? Sure. Is that through the, through the library, Marsha? Yeah, I do it through the library. Yeah, and I use I, it. I use it with Catalina. So yeah, you, you, you use OverDrive with Catalina? Yeah. I, okay. Are you using Libby or OverDrive? Libby. See that they're different. I could use Libri, but I can't well, use OverDrive. Uh, with it's the same books. You, uh, you should go check with um, whoever produces OverDrive to see if they produced a 64-bit uh, version. Most of the- Well, I, I did that and they don't. Uh, well, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I was hoping maybe there was some kind of workaround that I could you know, get the computer to ignore it. And, uh, and I do that. I use the overdrive for a specific reason because I have an old iPod, and uh, I'm not sure I could use Libby to uh, download them. But I have consistently used overdrive up until this point. Um, the well, the answer is there's no real way to trick it into it. The reason why Apple went to with 64-bit um, is it just makes your machine that much safer and i could give you a really tough technical mm -hmm. reason for it but um, by going to 64-bit without doing anything else apple eliminated about 99 percent of the ways for people to break into a machine um, and um, it just it just makes it much more uh, secure plus in catalina they actually the part of your computer that holds the operating system is now separate from the part that holds your data. So they can't intermix the two and it's almost impossible for things to take over your machine. So Apple's not gonna go backward and it's really up to, um, it's really up to the uh, uh, 
manufacturer, uh, the publisher of the program to get a 64-bit version. One particular program that I use a lot is a statistic program for crunching log files. And the company went out of business 10 years ago. So that particular one, I cannot get a 64-bit version. And what I've done is I've set up a, uh, a virtual machine that has an older 32-bit operating of the system of the Mac, and that allows me to run this program. However, that's really kind of a PhD project that I would not recommend for most of you. Uh, right. Uh, it's, um, <laughs> it, it works for me, but I really can't recommend it for most people. Yeah, somehow I can't see myself doing that. Um, let me tell you another thing that happened recently. I have an old iPod Nano, which I love, and I have about 20 books on it. And uh, I normally, uh, you know, when it runs low on power, I plug it in and then come back in a couple hours and it's good. Well, I did that. And when I unplugged it, it was dead as a doornail. I mean, it was just, it wasn't doing anything. So, um, uh, I, I thought it probably was a battery problem, and so I went searching around trying to find somebody who could open this thing and put a new battery in and what have you, and uh, I couldn't find anybody. So I finally gave up and I called Apple, and they have a, a iPod desk, and she said to me, have you tried a different power cord? And that never occurred to me. I, my power cord seemed to be pretty good. So I said, well, no, let me go, you know, try one right now. So I tried a different power cord and it lit right up. <laughs> and so if you have trouble with something, try a different power cord. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, one of the things that people don't realize is that a lot of the cables actually have um, computer chips in them. And um, like, for example, the HDMI cables the, that your TV has. Uh, people quite often will say, I don't understand, my HDMI cable was working last week, now it's broken. Well, those cables have computer chips in them, and HDMI cables in particular are very, very sensitive to static electricity. So just going across the carpet and touching the HDMI cable can kill it. Um, lightning cables and things that you plug your, your Nano and your iPhone, so on and so forth, aren't that bad, but they are they are delicate electronic equipment and a lot of people will wad them up and throw them in their purse or something like that. And in the process, they will damage them. So uh, that is something to consider. Um, Julie, you have your hand raised. Did you mean to raise your hand? I do. Hi, how are you? Hi. Did you? Um, <clears throat> my question is, what? Go ahead. Can I go? Okay, so I have a desktop computer that's probably 2011, maybe a little older, and I cannot get Wi-Fi or Ethernet connected to it. I have like five other devices that are connected to either computers, iPhones, and I'm just thinking, but what she said about the cable, but I'm thinking if it was broken, the other computer another desktop would not be connected. So is it possible my desktop is too old to connect anymore? Um, the, the simple answer is the ethernet, if it's got ethernet in it and you plug it into a valid ethernet port that works with something else, it should work. Um, the Wi-Fi, it's possible. A lot of people have really, really old uh, equipment that's older than what they thought. This one woman was telling me that she thought she or she bought her laptop back in 2013, and I looked at it, and it was actually from 2004. And that laptop was literally too old to work with current Wi-Fi. Current Wi-Fi insists on encrypting uh, the, the Wi-Fi and so on and so forth, and hers was too old. 2011 shouldn't be too old for the Wi-Fi, but it may not like the the it may be too old for the type of encryption that the Wi-Fi supports. That's a possibility. But if you have other things that work with that Ethernet cable and it doesn't work with the laptop, that suggests that you might have a, a problem with the motherboard on the, uh, on the laptop. 
the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet. It's a desktop. Oh, the, well, the, the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet both connect to a certain part of the uh, circuit board that has networking. And if that particular part of the circuit board isn't working anymore, it'll take out both at once, um, which is probably not what you want to hear. Okay. But if, if Ethernet works for one device and it doesn't work for this, that's usually not a good sign. And <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, well, thank you. There's no rabbit for that, I'm afraid. Uh, Sabrina, did you, did you have your okay, hand thank up? you. You're welcome. Sabrina, your hand is up. And you're, okay. you're on. So I have a question. Yes. Um, Thank you, actually, my question in an email, but I'm in the process of getting an iMac, and I'm not sure if I should just take the stock iMac like what Apple, or I'm sorry, what Costco has in their generic ones, or because I'd like to upgrade the RAM and a few other things. Is it worth paying the extra to Apple for the RAM, or can I do it myself? And how hard is it to open the back of an iMac? Okay, I'm that, nervous because it's the screen and everything is one. And in a laptop, you have, you know, the screen's not involved when you open it. Yeah, the um, I I did see Sabrina's question. I did not respond to it because I was busy doing other things at the time. And uh, also, it's a good question for everybody else as well. One of the problems that I don't like with what Apple does is that they call all the devices the same thing. So an iMac can cover anything from a plastic white machine with a 17-inch uh, display that they produced 20 years ago almost to something that they produced today. Like um, uh, they, the latest iMac has uh, something like eight i9 processors on in it and I think it's got warp drive and uh, the lithium crystals. And I mean, it's they really they 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 really are not even remotely the same machine. And the problem is that as Apple has progressed with the way in which they develop the machines, they've also changed the way in which you do things like upgrade memory. A lot of iMacs. I don't know about any of the current ones because I've not haven't bothered to look. But a lot of the iMacs have sol uh, soldered on memory. And the reason why they solder the memory on is not to prevent people from upgrading it, but to greatly reduce the number of repair costs that they have from people fiddling with them. And it also lowers greatly the, the uh, uh, cost of manufacture. It, 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 that way, when the machine goes out the door, it's already got all the little RAM it needs, and it's already been tested and everything works fine. So a lot of machines have uh, soldered in memory that you cannot upgrade and you cannot change. Um, some of them you can uh, add memory, but it's really, really, really difficult. For example, uh, the Mac Minis, some of the models of the Mac Mini you can add memory, but when you read the instructions on how to do it, most people will faint dead away. You turn the machine upside down and you uh, remove a bunch of screws and then you remove other things and then you remove parts of the machine and eventually you get to the point where you can upgrade the memory. So a lot of people, when they see what's involved, they don't really want to do that. Um, for the IMAX, it can be as simple as turning it. I've done this on uh, my mother's machine. Um, I, I um, put down a, 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 a four or five towels on the kitchen table. So it was multiple layers of soft towels laid it down face down so that the display is downward and I removed a plate but the plate is right under the um, the stand so it's difficult to get to and then I literally used dental tools to slowly pry out what was in there and put the new things back in so uh, is it usable user upgradable yes would I advise most people to do it not really um, and so I can't give you I can't give you a definitive answer because I don't know how the current ones are made. I don't know if they have soldered in memory or not. I don't know how easy they are to upgrade. There was one model of the iMac that they don't make anymore that you literally had to take off the screen from the machine in order to get access to the inside. And uh, I don't know of anybody who 
people ever did that that didn't end up with white hair. They might have been only 20 when they did it, but after doing that, they had white hair. It was really kind of a scary thing to do. Um, so I can't, I, can't, I can't tell you about how difficult it is to, is it user upgradable? Don't know. How difficult it is? Don't know, because I haven't looked at this recently. I will give you some advice, though, on how much memory you have, you need. Don't buy a Mac without 16 gigs of RAM. And I say that because for most people outside of NASA engineers and former geeks who work for NOAA, 16 gigabytes is going to be more than enough for you. Um, I say that knowing that Kathleen, for example, when she got her laptop, I don't remember how much she wanted in it, but it was 32 or 64 gigs. For most people, that's overkill, but for 16, uh, for in Kathleen's case, it's not overkill. She does weird stuff, but um, she's also got a PhD, so you know it kind of goes with the territory. But for most people, 16 gigs is enough for everything they plan on doing during the life of the machine. Eight gigs will work because of the way the Mac works, but with eight gigs, there is a chance that as you do things more, uh, more um, difficult, time-consuming, memory consumption, the machine will slow down. And the reason is that if the Mac runs out of RAM, it uses the disk drive to hold what's called swap memory. That sounds like a great idea, and for most things it is. But the problem is that you measure uh, RAM speed in billionths of a second. You measure disk speed in thousandths of a second. And there's a huge difference in speed between billionths and thousandths. So if at all possible, you don't want to be using uh, swap disk space in place of real RAM. And that's why I recommend uh, 16 gigabytes. If you're running things like virtual machines, you probably want to use uh, 32. If you're doing video or uh, some really exotic photography, you might want more than 32 gigabytes. But for most people, uh, don't get less than 16. And for most people, you don't need to get more. That'll be enough. And if I you do it myself, will I cancel out my Apple Care? Um, that's a good question. At one point, if you did your own me memory upgrade, you can you would cancel out your app uh, your uh, Apple Care. That uh, the Apple, in response to a lawsuit by who knows why, they've changed that. But if your upgrade um, damaged the machine then the repair, you pay the full price even if you have Apple Care, Because at that point, it's not, considered a, it's not considered a warranty defect and you pay the full price of the repair, even if it is under warranty. So the answer is, yes, you can do your own, but it, um, if, if you break something, you pay the full price for fixing it. And solid state is worth it over the fusion, right? Oh, that, mm, that's, a, that's a more complicated question. Um, if you buy an iMac today, you can get it with a regular hard drive, you can get it with a Fusion drive, or you can get it with a, what's called an SSD, which is a solid state drive. And a solid state disk is basically just a memory chip that's got a whole bunch of memory on it. Uh, SSD drives are extremely fast, but they're still, per gigabyte, they're more expensive than hard drives. The Fusion Drive is an Apple uh, special type of thing where it's a combination of solid state disk and a regular rotating disk, like all hard disks. And what it does is it uses the solid state disk as kind of an accelerator for the disk. So if you have a Fusion Drive, your hard drive just seems really, really, really fast. And that's because for what the work that you're currently doing in process, it saves to the solid state drive. And then as the machine has more time, it eventually saves it to the hard drive. So the solid state drive is, is, is kind of, uh, it's the, um, it's just, it, it acts like a really fast hard drive. But you're not saving things really to that. It's an intermediate space in between the computer and the hard drive. Um, and fusion drives are really, really clever. They're much faster than, um, a hard drive, but they're slower than solid state drive. The difficulty comes if your machine crashes. In order of precedence, 
it's easier to reach, is assuming the hard drive just really isn't completely dead, it's easier to recover from a hard drive. And then the second place, it's easier to recover from a solid state disk. And third is a fusion drive. Fusion drives, because you do not know probably when it failed, it's really hard to tell if your data really is gonna be stored on it because it might not have ever actually made it to the hard drive. It might have been in the solid state uh, drive when it uh, died. And if that happens, you really can't recover it. So it's a, that's a complicated answer to the question. Um, most data centers do not use uh, fusion type drives. They either use hard drives or they use solid state drives, but the fusion drives they don't use because um, their job is to store stuff and um, trying to recover from a fusion drive is difficult. For most consumers though, a, a, a fusion drive is just a way to get a lot more storage without paying for a massive solid state drive that costs a lot of money. If you, if you go look at the, the drive prices on Apple's website, you'll see that the solid state drives are considerably more expensive than the hard drives. And that's the reason it's that, uh, it's very difficult to make that drive memory that fast. Um, it's, it's expensive. They end up throwing away a lot of the material. I know you said, I'll just order Apple and not try to save a couple hundred bucks trying to do it myself. Um, I want another thing. This is not a, this is not an anti Costco thing, but, um, just as a kind of a warning, Costco, the uh, Macs that they sell, and it's also true for the PCs, are basically the entry model. And Costco really doesn't offer you anything other than the entry model. So unless you want the entry model, Costco is probably not the best source for it. Um, um, and then around yeah, here, I'm sorry? Well, it's, I was, whether it's Costco or from Apple Direct, um, to just get what they have in a box, but everything that I want has to be made or, you know, it's not stock what they have. And I was trying to avoid paying sales tax by getting it in Oregon when I'm down there, but you can't have it shipped to the store. You have to have it shipped to, um, well, I could have it shipped to a friend's house, but I was trying to uh, get out of paying sales tax anyway. So yeah, whether I ordered it at Apple or Costco, um, I think I'll just have to order it or have them have my, uh, the way I want it with the specific RAMs because they don't have it in stock at the stores. Uh, yeah, the, um, the uh, Costco always has the entry level model. And if you go to an Apple store, usually they'll have in stock the, in, um, at uh, Tacoma or Aldersgate or the University uh, Village, which is my favorite one. Um, they usually have three levels. They have a low, medium, and a high. And if you want something other than whatever they happen to have packaged, you have to order it from Apple. Um, that's just the way it is because uh, I, I think there's something like for, for, an, for an iMac, there's something like 300 different yeah. thousand combinations, literally 300,000 combinations on how you can put it together. And, they don't it's have a, all those. It's smug. I'm sorry? I can put I it through. through forgot, I forgot I had those fries in there. Oh, yeah. So I heated them up just a little bit. Put some um, ketchup. Okay. Popcorn. Not that. Good. Uh, so with the potatoes. Okay. Um, You're welcome. It's after seven, so I'm going to start the meeting, and I'm going to start off. By, on Zoom. Going to start by muting everybody. So, wait a second. Uh, and I've just muted everybody. I'm going to uh, unmute our president if I can find her. Where are I just did it. Oh, okay. Um, Madam President, is there anything you want to say? <laughs> First of all, I want to welcome everybody. Um, I think we have a few new names with no video, I think. Um, am I, is that correct? Does any, 
do we have new people this evening? Uh, ham Sessions, I know. Ninnies, I know. Lily, I've seen before. Uh, Jude, I don't know. So I will. And Julie, I remember when it was before uh, Lawrence and I took over. Um, so she's new, but she's not new. Okay. And um, I haven't. Uh, I'm fairly new. I've been off and on. Yes, I remember uh, Joe. Yeah. I just don't want to miss anybody and and sure. welcome whoever um, yeah. is new. But I I think hi Chris. Okay. So that does I'm remind done. me, I owe you some uh, membership fees. How much is it? Um, it is 24. I'm actually going to hand it over here in a second to the treasurer. She'll give you a, a, a report. Again, on the, um, Lawrence, do you have the sign in? Could you put it in the chat? Oh, the, I, um, I sent it in the email, but I, uh, I'll need to find it and I'll, I'll stick it in the chat. Okay, so I will just make the announcement again. For the dues, it's $24, and I will put in the address and who you can make it out to in on the right side where the chat is. And um, yeah, you can either make it out to Smug or just um, uh, Straight Mac uh, user group. And again, it's $24. The um, address we're putting in here, it's a, a like a PO box, so it's secure. Nobody can get to it. Um, it's at, at a, what's it called? Mailboxes two, I think they're called, in the um, Oasis parking lot. So yeah, it's secure. And I don't think I have anything else. Oh, one more question. I noticed we're recording. Is there a reason for that, Lawrence? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen? Oh, yeah. Kathleen's supposed to be doing something else. She's supposed to be writing a sermon. So um, I'm doing recording so that we have some record of what we did so we can write up notes. Um, but we're not going to keep it. We're not going to publish it. Um, I, I, I just noticed it. I did publish the, I did put the uh, attendance form in the chat window. And Julie asked, is it $20, $24 per person or for house, per household? It's per household. Household, yeah. Um, and I will turn it over to Annalise, the treasurer, and she'll give you a report. Okay. Well, uh, so for right now, uh, we have $853.55 in the account. And we started just a little bit over a year ago with the dues. I think it was in August of 19. And uh, so we have a total of, that came in was $1,230. Then we had some expenses for the, for the World Press uh, that Lawrence set up the website. website. We had once it was $124.03, and then the other one was $104.16. And um, Lawrence can explain it better than I can exactly what it was for. But then the other expense was for um, $111.01. That was for the Zoom. So that, that, that's a one year. Um, Prescription, I think, right? Yes. Or subscription. Yes. Yeah. And the only other expense we had was um, to get some checks. We bought some checks that was twenty-seven twenty-five. So that brings us now to a balance of eight hundred fifty-three dollars and fifty-five cents. And if anybody has any more questions about it, feel free to ask. Yeah, among other things, and we're going to have another bill for the website coming up because I don't remember when it needs to renew, but it's sometime in the next month or two. Yeah, I think the, the year is almost up. I think we're getting close to a year since we've been doing this. Yep. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, I will send out, I'll double check who has been a year or longer 
uh, who is due, we are not going from year to, I mean, from January to January. Whenever somebody pays the dues, we will remind them in a year when they are due again. And I will send out an email uh, as a reminder. Uh, there was one thing about that that I wanted to, uh, it's kind of an administrative thing. I have maintained, uh, I, I got the mailing list from the old smug that dissolved and uh, I've been sending out messages on that list for some time, but I'm tempted at this point to um, not, to, to just not, to delete the contacts for people who have not attended or paid dues uh, in the past year. And the reason is that it causes, it causes grief because the mailing list is about 350 people long. And um, mm -hmm. if I get a bunch of bounces, Google shuts down my mail uh, service for uh, 24 hours, which has been uh, annoying. So if I get rid of those, it doesn't generate as many, you're only allowed to have like 300 messages per day for free. And I exceed that limit when I send things out to the billing list. So I'm tempted to uh, just purge people who haven't either attended or paid dues. And my question is, mm -hmm. does anyone think that's a good or a bad idea? Uh, uh, Paul, did you have I a I think it's a good idea. Paul? Did you want to say something? You have to unmute Paul. I tried. I think he's muted at his end because I've unmuted him. I can't hear you, Paul. Uh, still can't hear Paul. Anyway, Chris gave me a little clap symbol. Uh, I have a. <laughs> For, uh, suggestion May yes. maybe uh, maybe you could send out uh, a kind of warning email or just a notice that you will be purging the list okay of un, you know inactive people give it a what month or two or whatever all right and then that, do it yeah. that sounds reasonable that's basically what I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> yes, Chris? Question about that. Yeah. Yes. As long as we're as long as we're zooming, um I I approve. But but um I know that the postings that I do on next door go only to twenty-one neighborhoods. They don't even go to some of the east and west neighborhoods that are north of Washington Street. Um, I, I don't even know how many there are in the Squim area, but I know it does not go to the Port Angeles next door neighborhoods. So I'm wondering if there's any way we can get that word out. So I'm thinking some of the PA people who used to come to evening meetings might be interested in Zooming. And even if they've gotten emails from the, that Lawrence that you've sent, they may not be getting reinforcement, I guess is what I'm looking for. I don't know how many of us this evening are actually in Port Angeles. Um, it has, it, it, is I'm, anyone here I'm just, west of, say, um, my geography is suspect? Dungeness River. Uh, yeah, west of Dungeness River. George is? Um, yes, yeah, Port Angeles. OK. Yeah. Um, what yes, I can but what you were saying is that these um, these people are already receiving the emails, so it's right. not so they're not just wouldn't they wouldn't be just hearing it through next door. They're 
also getting it through their email or contact that we had previous to the old smug group. Right. But I'm but I'm threatening so, um, I'm threatening to purge that. Um, right. Yeah. Maybe one last chance and just say this is the last. Uh, you know. Well, I, I like the Can idea that in, in the P. I like the idea of um, sending out a, a notice, say next month and the month after that, that as of like 2021, um, if you haven't attended in the, in the past year and you haven't paid membership, uh, we're going to put you in an inactive file. It just occurred to me that I don't actually have to kill off the contact. I can just put them in another mailing list that I don't use. Uh, so I still have the contact information, but uh, that's a good idea, uh, but I, I, I really can't, it's not really sustainable with 300 uh, or more than 300 addresses because um, it just, if, some, if, you, if I send out a message right now and you respond that day, there's a good chance I can't respond to you until that 24 hour um, timeout period uh, expires. And it's, it's frustrating. So I, I'm trying to, um, I don't want to send out messages for people who aren't attending and um, aren't talking to us. So, but I'll send out a couple of warning messages. That's a good idea. And with that, I should probably get to the presentation. And I managed to hide something I was going to. Uh, talk about and um, I don't know what I do with that. I is, have anybody, is, is everybody here on wave cable or for wave for their internet? Have you had any problems in the last 24, 48 hours? No? I've had problems a with friend of us. She. I've had problems not with the past months. twenty-four hours. Yeah. Well, a couple of friends, I think, that be on tonight, but they don't have wave. The the system is down for them. Yeah, we're in Sunland, and yeah. so it's been pretty good here so far. Yeah, the um, Wave has definitely had some problems the past couple months. I have a little device that monitors my connection. And when we first moved here, I'd have one or two outages of a minute to 15 minutes a month. And last month, I had 18 days that did not have an outage. So um, that's not a, not a good track record. Um, I'd like to start the presentation now, and the first thing I want to talk about is Apple had a special event last week that they called uh, Speed, which was nice and ambiguous. And um, they, at the Speed event, they introduced a bunch of new phones, uh, um, iPhone 12, they now comes in a mini, a regular, and an extra crispy that's larger. Um, and I'll talk about those in a second. The other thing that they mentioned that uh, caught my attention was their HomePod Mini. Um, we have HomePods here because I like the fact that it's a nice little compact box and I can wirelessly have it play music and do a bunch of other things. And you can say, hey Siri, and it'll answer questions and uh, yell at the TV when TV has a Apple commercial. It's interesting if you have a HomePod and Apple has a commercial on TV talking about Siri, the HomePod will argue with the TV saying, I didn't understand that. But um, aside from aside from <laughs> arguing with the TV, it is quite useful. And if you have two of them, which I have, they automatically sync up and uh, play in stereo. And the sound quality is really quite outstanding. I can play classical music on it and it sounds um, uh, it, it sounds really good. The HomePod Mini, I have not actually seen, and they're much smaller, and I can't believe they have the same audio quality simply because it doesn't have things like the big woofer in the bottom 
um, that the uh, uh, standard HomePod has. But they've introduced a new feature that when it starts shipping, I think sometime in November, called intercom. And in our house, my, uh, my mother has real hearing problems and the house is big enough that uh, it's not a huge house, but if I don't know where Kathleen is, I can spend a couple of minutes wandering through the house trying to find out where she is. With the intercom, if you have it in the major rooms of the house, I can say, I can tell Siri to uh, uh, pass on a message to Kathleen and say, Kathleen, can you tell me where you are? And then she can use the HomePod to reply to it. So it acts as an automatic intercom throughout the entire house. And unlike the ones that you used to use where you have to push the button and hold it down and hope it's working, this one just works with Siri. So you tell Siri, hey, tell Kathleen, do such and such, and it'll broadcast it through all of the home pods in your house, um, which we just thought was a fantastic idea. Plus they did some other things to integrate it in with the, your phone and, and whatnot. And the uh, original home pod was something like, I don't remember what it was, 350, something like that. The no home pod minis um, are 99 bucks. So um, it's a fairly, if you look, if you went and just looked at an intercom system for the house, that's not much more than a regular intercom system that doesn't play music. So that uh, really excited us and we were going to um, think about it. Think about it in our house means that I'm really cheap and probably don't want to spend the money, but Kathleen got really excited when she saw that. So um, the question is, do, will I, um, hold out to Kathleen's enthusiasm. That's basically the question at hand. Yeah, you uh, she just said that, no, I won't. Um, so we've already jointly <laughs> decided that I'm going to succumb. Yeah, I'm the, um, uh, the other, the big announcement, the other big announcement was the iPhone 12. The iPhone 12, they've changed the design somewhat um, back to an earlier design. There once was a, a few years ago, the uh, I think it was the iPhone 5 had basically it was a flat side on the front, flat on the back, and then it had an aluminum edge to it. And they're returning basically to that design, I think, because uh, people have had problems with the more modern designs that they had. Uh, that they were too slippery. The very first iPhone was extremely difficult to hold on to. Uh, that was a long time ago, but uh, it was very difficult to hold on to. Kathleen and I were uh, at a mall in um, um, Maryland the very first day that the uh, first iPhone came out. And this girl came out of the Apple store. She had her, she had her old Nokia tucked underneath her uh, chin, and she was talking into her Nokia as she ripped open her iPhone box. And as she ripped it open, it popped out of the box and she could not catch it and it disassembled itself all over the marble uh, walkway. So she had it out of the Apple store and in her hands for about a second before it self-destructed. Um, and over the years, they've tried to make them easier to hold on to without being so super slippery that they commit suicide. And this is going back to a previous design because the um, immediate past designs, people again were having trouble holding on to them. So I think they didn't say this, but I think that's why they went back to this design. Um, the other thing that they did, which was interesting, is that they have a new glass on it. The glass that they currently use is called Gorilla Glass mm -hmm. and it's made by Corning. And it's really, really, really tough. Um, I don't advise you to go play with your iPhone in a um, um, sandbox. But if you did, a, the, the phone would probably survive. It might get a little scratched up, but it'd probably survive. The new one is basically a transparent ceramic. Uh, and it was developed by, uh, again, by Corning. And it basically puts a crystalline uh, ceramic over the, uh, uh, over the face of the phone that's transparent. So you can see through it but they say it's up to three times stronger than the uh, uh, previous uh, covering. Mm -hmm. um, and that, from a material science point of view, I thought that was really quite exciting. Science fiction writers have been talking about 
developing uh, transparent ceramics now for 30 years and um, pretty soon you'll be able to have a transparent ceramic on your iPhone. The phone itself doesn't do that much different than the current version, but you wouldn't have been able to tell that from the um, Apple presentation because I'd say about a third of the presentation was a commercial for Verizon. In the United States, the, the big carriers are, you know, there's Sprint and a whole bunch of other people, but the two big ones are AT&T and Verizon. When we moved here, we had AT&T, and it was a conscious decision on our part because um, Kathleen was in the Navy during 9-11, and on 9-11, and when we managed to get home, which was about almost 25 hours after we left home, um, a very long day for us, we decided we needed cell phones because our dear daughter was in middle school and she was frantic because she hadn't heard from her parents all day. So we got cell phones for everybody in the family. And Kathleen got a military discount. And in about 2010, AT&T tried to take away the discount without telling anybody and they got sued and they continued it on in, perpetu in perpetuity. So as long as Kathleen was an AT&T customer, she got this discounted rate because she'd been in the military. And that was fine until we moved here and we found out that in Sunland, her AT&T phone spent up basically about 14 months not talking to anybody. Even within the house, she couldn't either send or receive a phone call and that really torqued us off that she wanted to make a, she was working for, still working for the government at the time. When she wanted to make a phone call, she had to drive into town, uh, go to Kerry Blake Park and sit underneath the, um, the um, microwave um, antenna there in order to make um, a um, phone call. And I mention this because the international standard for the radio system that they use for cell phones is the one that AT&T uses. And so when we went overseas, if you had an AT&T phone, you didn't have to do anything different. You just got a, you got a temporary account with Orange or whoever it was that was in that country, and it worked. Verizon is proprietary, and it doesn't work any place other than the United States because Verizon is proprietary. However, Verizon has a much better network in the United States, and in particular around here, we became Verizon customers. During Apple's special event, Verizon talked for about a third, a quarter to a third of the time because the new iPhone has 5G. And that sounds great because 5G is faster and it, 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 it does all kinds of wonderful things. It'll, it'll, it'll comb your hair, it'll clean your clothes, wonderful stuff. The problem is, with that is that there is no standard for 5G. That's one problem. It's basically a marketing term. The other issue with 5G is that if you live on the Olympic Peninsula, don't get your hopes up that we're gonna see it anytime soon. And that's because Verizon tends to put new technologies in population centers. That doesn't describe the Olympic Peninsula. Um, except for the five deer that were in our backyard, there's really not much of a population around here. So if you want to get a, a, an iPhone 12 so that you can use 5G, you can use it when you go to Seattle maybe, but you're, it'll probably be quite a while before you're going to be. Um, we have trouble with 4G in, on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, but that was the big thing that has 5G. The other thing that, um, uh, aside from the Gorilla Grass that they, they had, is that they've done spiffy things with the camera. The camera, as far as I can tell, is basically the same resolution as the current one, but the, um, um, they're using a lot of processing power to do things like for low light photography. So that you can take low light photography um, that you can actually see something useful. A lot of uh, low light photography is very grainy and they had some sample photos that they'd taken in low light that were just stunning. Um, I have some high-end photography gear and it would, it would be really hard to duplicate what they did. And it was even more shocking when you realized it was available light. There were no artificial light sources. I have a light source here for the video uh, so that I don't look like just a dark spot. 
they weren't using any kind of uh, extra lighting at all, and they were just stunning stuff. But those, um, of the three different types of cameras that they have, they got the iPhone mini. It has some of that technology. The regular iPhone has a bit more, but a lot of the really special stuff is in the iPhone Pro and iPhone Pro Max, which are at the high end. And those have three lenses and do all kinds of spi uh, spi uh, spiffy stuff. So for the, if, if you went, if you listen to the program, uh, 5G is not going to help us too much. The Gorilla, not the Gorilla Glass, but this new uh, uh, transparent ceramic, that is a nice thing to have on a phone because if you have a phone at some time or another, you're going to drop it. And then the uh, uh, camera, the camera look, it, 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 it should be able to turn a, 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 a so-so uh, photographer into a really good um, photographer in low light. I was, I was very impressed with that. Um, Today in 2020, people take more photos with their iPhones than they make phone calls. So putting uh, the, that amount of effort into the uh, camera might seem like overkill to a lot of people, but I think it's, it was probably a good call on Apple's part. Um, whether you want to spend the money on, on that is, is another matter. But uh, in, terms of the, in terms of what it does on the telephone side, yeah, not much benefit to us, um, but on the photography end, I think it was, um, I, I was impressed. Um, and so that's what the special event was about. And with that, I'm now gonna turn to our, actually I spent more than half the time we have, huh? <laughs> gonna talk about word processing. And for that, I'm going to um, share my screen. The, um, there are basically, three different uh, word processors, uh, families out there for people today. And uh, there are the, um, there's Microsoft um, Office um, is, um, uh, I, I lost my notes. There's Microsoft Office. I stored them in the cloud and I stored them on an account that I can't get to right this second. Bad move for me. Uh, there's Microsoft Office, uh, comes with Microsoft Word. There is Apple Pages, which comes with the Apple uh, Automation Suite. And then there are cloud-based things. Microsoft Office, the current version, Microsoft Office 365, is both a desktop app, it's an iPhone and an iPad app, and it's also a cloud app. So you can actually do something in Microsoft Office on your desktop, you can do it in the cloud, or you can do it just on your iPad or iPhone. The same is true with Pages. Uh, pages, a lot of people got really upset with them a couple, several years ago when they redesigned Pages, but they did that so that you could operate it on a, your Mac, you can operate it on your phone, you can operate it on your iPad, and you can also operate it in the cloud. And those are the two big competitors. The third one is Google Docs. Uh, Google Docs is entirely cloud-based, and basically if you have a web browser and an active internet connection, it has, uh, it has, it has uh, Google Docs itself, which is a word processor. It's got sheets for spreadsheet. It's got slides for um, equivalent of either Keynote or PowerPoint. It's got a web-based calendar. Um, it's got a whole bunch of things. Uh, and that's from Google. And I want to give a quick demonstration of, um, of uh, a few of these. I'm going to start off with Microsoft Word, and I'm going to show my screen. I've been using Microsoft Word since Kathleen bought it for me in 1984. Um, Word was originally produced for PCs in 1983, but it was entirely, uh, entirely text-driven, so that if you wanted to make something bold-faced, you typed in codes. And um, that was all well and good, but it wasn't very popular. The first GUI version, graphical user interface version, came out on the Mac in 1984, and Kathleen was on a military trip back to the United States. We were living in Japan. She came back with Microsoft Office and I, Microsoft Word at the time, and I was quite uh, impressed. 
And then in 1989, the very first version of Microsoft Office was for the Mac, and that's because uh, PowerPoint and Excel both came out on the Mac before they came out on Windows. And they bundled them together in, in, into Microsoft Office in 1989. So you had a word processor, you had a spreadsheet, and you had slide presentation all in one package, and that dates to 1989. And this is Microsoft Office uh, 365, and it doesn't really, it, it's basically the same as it's always been, with the fact that I did something a little bit, I was gonna show you that later. But this is a document that I pulled off the web. It's a GSA document. It's written in Microsoft Office. It's easy enough to go find these things if you bring up a word processor and you tell it to, uh, go out there and search for things that say DOC and tell it just to go out there and search, it'll go out and find files that end in DOC, which is the extension type for the old version of Microsoft Word. And if you say DOCX, it'll go out and search for things that have the new, ver new file format for uh, Microsoft uh, Word. And that's what this is. This is a Microsoft Word off, um, uh, document that I pulled up off the web. And I want to use this as an example of something that you can do, uh, some things you can do with Microsoft. Obviously, word, word processors are among the most complicated programs ever written. And that's because there are almost infinite number of ways to express yourself on paper. Microsoft Word will even go from uh, right to left in case you're doing um, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Arabic, Hebrew. It'll go from left to right. It'll go from top to down. It doesn't go from bottom to up, but it'll be pretty much any direction you want, you can do that in Word. So there are some fundamentally difficult ways to put things on paper that Word supports. And the same thing is true for pages. So I'm gonna take this random document, and one of the things that I do when I'm putting things up on the web is the first thing I do is I strip out a whole bunch of invisible characters. And Word has this little symbol up here that looks like a paragraph feed, if I click that, it shows me the invisible characters. So these are carriage returns, and there's page break, and here's some tabs, and it also shows spaces. And one of the things you can do is you can go up under edit, and you can say find, and say replace, and I can go through, and one of the things that people do that they should not do is they use double spaces. So I type two spaces, and it lists every place in this document where there are two spaces. So when I have two spaces, I tell it to replace them with one. I say replace all, and it replaced 74 of them. And in the process, I also notice that this document has track changes on it. So it says that Lawrence Charters on this date deleted something. I absolutely hate track changes, but it, it exists for a reason, but I don't care. We're going to turn it off uh, as soon as I remember how to turn it off. Okay, we're going to come back here, and we're going to turn all of these things off and it'll go away. Um, so you can go through and search how many times did I use the word the and it'll tell you that I used 315, I didn't write this thing, but uh, 315 occurrences of the word the. Now notice if I don't put a space there, it'll come up with 356 because at that point it's also going to have there and anything that has that as a string. But if I put a space after it, then it only looks for mm -hmm. things, it looks for the. So you know, there are a lot of powerful things, things that you can do with a word processor. I uh, used to write science fiction once upon a time and I type in a shortcut for the name of this long space alien. And then later on I'd use uh, find and replace to take that short code and turn it into that space alien's long name. Or uh, if I wanted to, this thing I don't think mentions FCC, but if say it had FCC in there, abbreviations really drive people nuts. So one of the things I would do is I say FCC, search for that and re replace it with Federal Communications Commission. And it'll go through and replace all of them. And that's much easier than typing it all over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's a basic word processing thing. But to, in order to put things on the web, a lot of these invisible codes just cause me grief. Like for example, these, this is a, a centered carriage return, which is just kind of stupid. Why, if it's a, if it's blank paper, 
if you turn it off, that's just a blank part of the page. There's no particular reason to center that. So you can go through and you can do things like you can get rid of white space. White space is basically anything that doesn't appear on the page. So like a space or a tab or a string of spaces. There are some invisible codes in, in Microsoft Word that people don't know about. And one of them is white space. If you type in a caret, a caret is uh, shift, where is the caret? Shift six is caret, caret w, it'll replace white space with whatever you tell it to. And it found 3,222 examples of white space. I'm gonna replace it with a space. And I tell it to go replace them. And it did that. So in the process of doing that, I, I managed to kill off all of the tabs in here. And now that I've got a bunch of extra spaces, I'm going to tell it to go through and look for two tab spaces, replace them with one. And I get rid of all of that. And I've cleaned up my document a bit, but I still have these silly um, things that are centered when they don't need to be. And that's a little bit easier, easier to take care of than you might think. If you go up here and you select the entire document and then you click this button right here, it aligns everything to the right. And I just did that for the entire document with just a, key, a couple of keystrokes. The command A selects all, and then I collect this and I align right and it, it aligned it all in one time. I'm showing you with this Microsoft Word because I've been using Microsoft Word for uh, over 30 years. I really know how to use Microsoft Word. But pretty much everything that you can do in Microsoft Word, you can also do in Pages. Um, another thing I want to show you with Microsoft that Word has to do with how you save things. If I wanted to save this, notice that I have a lot of different choices. I can save it as a Word document. I can save it as an old Word document. I can save it as a template. I can save it as something called rich text. I can save it as text. I can also save it as a PDF. So it gives you a lot of different ways that which you can uh, save things. And I'm not gonna save it in any of these. I'm just gonna quit out of this because I want to show you pages. Uh, no, I don't want to save the pages. Um, if I can find pages in my toolbar. All right. If you want to find something in a hurry, if you press the command key in the space bar, spotlight comes up and you just type in pages and it launches pages. I don't have to go find out where it's hiding. And I say I don't want to open it something, I want to come over here. Um, if I tell it to open up things on the desktop, that document that I download from the internet, that is a Word document and I'm using my Apple's pages it'll open it right up. It doesn't care that it was done in Microsoft Word. And it says that it might look a little bit different, but this is basically the same document. Apple's Word, uh, Pages Word Processor, reads and writes Microsoft Word documents. So I can come over here to do the same thing and say save as, and it does the, it gives me again, uh, different kinds of, uh, actually that's not the one I want to do. In pages, you have to say export to. I can export it to PDF, Word. It'll make something called an EPUB, which I'll talk about in a second. It'll do plain text, uh, rich text, a lot of different formats from Microsoft, uh, from, from uh, pages. Though it looks a little bit different because among other things, it can do things um, a little bit, I'll, I'll show you. If we come here and I see something new, you can choose something from a template. It'll have a blank page, it'll a blank page black, so you can actually have black paper and type with white text. You can do resumes and books and all kinds of different things with pages. It comes with built-in uh, templates for that. So pages is uh, quite, quite good. And the nice thing about pages is unlike Microsoft Word, it's free. If you have a Mac with a current operating system, you can just go to, um, um, the App Store and download it. Uh, it used to cost money, but now you can get it uh, pretty much for free. The um, um, one thing to note about this is that pages can't be read by anything other than pages. Uh, pages is a is a format unto itself. 
unlike Word, which has kind of become the standard for word processing. I, I want to show you another kind of, uh, of uh, uh, text editor, though. And for that, I'm going to launch this original document again. And I'm going to save it as a rich text file, which is RTF. It'll have an RTF extension. Tell it to save that. And I'm also going to save it as, I'm not even going to bother to save it that way. We're just going to open up the rich text format. Uh, another way to do word processing is what's something called a text editor. And a text editor is, um, and my little menu here is in the way. Um, a text editor is the one, the one that I like a lot is called BB Edit, and the BBA stands for bare bones. Um, it's not really, it's a programming uh, editor, and you can use it for writing code. So um, I'm not going to do some code right now. But one of the things you can do is you can take this rich text formatted file that we had, we drop it in here, and you'll see that rich text format, if I just double click on it, it's going to open, um, it's going to open text edit. You'll see that it, this is formatted, and, um, and my menu is in the way again. Oh, hey. You'll see that it's got bold face and it's got a bunch of, um, it's got a bunch of stuff here that's been, um, it's formatted text. But if you look at it in my text editor, it's got a whole bunch of codes here. And that's because rich text formatting actually is the old style that, that Microsoft used to have for Word. You used to have to type in all these codes if you wanted to change fonts and make things big or change the size and so on and so forth. This is what it used to look like. So that it, it you can be very glad that you're not using a word processor that does this anymore. Um, so what happens if you have something that's done like this or my, in Microsoft Word and you want to get rid of stuff, rid of all that formatting entirely? And that's where uh, BB Edit comes in. Because with BB Edit, I can go back to my document here that's got all this stuff in it, and I select it all, and I say copy, and I go into BB Edit, and I paste it in, and all I have left is the text. It got rid of all the formatting. Now, why is this important? And when I want to put it up on a web page, I need to get rid of the formatting, because a website has its own special way for doing uh, graphics like for example you notice these graphics at the top they have in the header the GSA symbol and whatever this thing is I don't know what that is those are graphics those don't appear at all and that's because on a, on a web page you insert those one at a time and you give them special attributes and for the for the text I need to just get rid of all of the formatting all of the centering and all that because for an HTML file, that's done um, by the web designer. It's not done by uh, your word processor. So in order to get rid of that stuff, I just copy it all in there and I paste it into my text editor and now I've got nice clean text. I still have to do things like get rid of a bunch of extra uh, line feeds and such, but that's that's a different thing. So th that's kind of the the how word processing works in the world. The original text editors were like BB Edit or like um, a more advanced version is Text Edit, which comes on your Mac. All of the instructions for programs are usually done in Text Edit. And Text Edit also has the ability to save, to, to uh, export things as a PDF, or you can save things in different formats. Um, and Text Edit also has a ability that a lot of people probably don't know about it can open up Word files. And I'll go and find my Word file here that we opened up earlier. And I've now opened up this manual uh, that I got off the internet in text edit. Now you notice it doesn't look not nearly as fancy because it's not a full-fledged word processor, but it opened it up. And that's done with uh, text edit. Now, before I turn off Word again, I want to show you some other things that you can do with a word processor that a lot of people don't know about. This is this document. Over here on the side, you see thumbnails of the pages. 
say I don't want it to be a 12 page document, I want it to be a uh, 10 page document or something uh, shorter. One of the things that I can do is I can go through and I can get rid of all those extra carriage returns that it's got in. And a carriage return is the code for that is a P. So I want to look for any place where there are two carriage returns in a row and replace them with one. And there are 83 double carriage returns. And I say replace them all. And I forgot to turn off track changes again. Let's turn that off. Track changes. Where are you? Track changes. Here are those. There's probably some more. Uh, I made 18 more replacements and made nine more replacements because it's got a whole bunch of carriage returns. And it's still got a couple to find. I'm going to give up there and just go back out here with uh, it's now, how big is it? It's 11 pages. It used to be 12, now to 11. I managed to reduce the size of the document just by getting rid of a bunch of uh, carriage returns. But there are other things you can do. Is if, you, if you've ever played around with, uh, had to write a college paper, and they say, uh, please, uh, I want you to turn in 10 pages, and what you want to do is going to be more than 10 pages, you can go through and you can change the document size. In this case, it wants a one inch top margin, one inch bottom, one inch left, one inch right. Most modern printers, they want at least 0.6 uh, inches. So we're going to make these 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and I say go, and it instantly makes it, well, it's still 11 pages, but part of that is because I've got page breaks in here. Um, so if I went through and got rid of the page breaks, like for example, this one right here, I'm down now to 10 pages. A lot of people don't know about this feature here where it formats the entire document at once. So I can format the, the margins, the layout, the document grid, uh, a lot of those things right mm -hmm. here. The other thing to note is that if you have a lot of text, sometimes it gets really hard to read. And one of the, one of the best ways to fix that is by the paragraph spacing. It, here it's got really weird spacing. But basically, that before a paragraph, have it auto. After a paragraph, add an extra six points of text. And what it does is it spaces out the paragraph so that you can actually, uh, I need some a block of text. Um, that, why didn't it do that? There we go. After six. And watch this text right on the screen in front of me. See how it spaced it out so it's much easier to read it? And that was done with just a few, few keystrokes. Uh, a lot of people don't really know how to use a word processor. Um, I recently got um, a, um, a woman in, in town. She wants to self-publish her book. And it was barfing when she uploaded it to Amazon to publish. She had stuck a carriage return at the end of every line. She was treating her computer as if it was an old-fashioned typewriter where at the end of the line you press return and the bell goes off and the, and the carriage goes back to the start. She, she had stuck a carriage return at the end of every line. And uh, Amazon book, automated book publishing thing just barfed all over that. It didn't like that at all. There are actually easy ways to fix that. Um, but um, uh, in her case, it... it, it um, it was not what she expected because it just came with the machine. She didn't want to spend any time um, learning how to use the word processor. So uh, she just started write, writing away and um, she was not happy with the result. I've mentioned this publisher before, but I'm gonna go back there and talk about them again. There's a company called Take Control Books. And I don't remember what their, Okay, it's just Take Control Books is the name of the website, all written as one word, Take Control Books, plural. But if you go to their site, they have a, a large uh, collection of books 
that are mostly Mac centric on things like Apple TV and Apple Watch and photos and so on and so forth. And if you just, uh, I can type in pages, for example, and it'll tell me all the books that they have on pages. There's pages itself, but preview function, the, the little preview app that shows um, photographs and so on and so forth, it does a lot of other things. And Mac command line and so on and so forth, but they've got a whole book on pages and you can get a little preview if you click on the page. And then if you want to buy the book, you can buy that right here in the download. Um, it'll download it directly to your machine and you can start using, using it, reading it yeah. immediately. It comes in either a PDF or an EPUB, which is something you can read on an iPad or your phone or, or on the Mac using the books application. And you can, you're just immediately in business, but they have books on pages and, and pretty much almost anything else you want to have. So anytime you get stuck and it's, it's three in the morning, you have a deadline, don't forget the fact that there really are things that, such as books that you can just download immediately. All it costs is a little bit of money, but um, uh, sometimes that might be uh, the difference between going crazy and not. And um, so there's a nice book on pages. They have got book on numbers. Numbers, which is the Apple spreadsheet, I will confess that I really never used it. But if you've ever had to deal with uh, PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint to make slides, I highly encourage you to get to know Keynote. Keynote is a much better way of producing slides. Mm -hmm. And um, just like pages can uh, read um, Word, Keynote can read and write uh, PowerPoint files. So uh, we tell it to open up, and we don't want to have to do anything here. We're going to make a new file. And you just, it's got a whole bunch of templates that come with it. And so we're going to take uh, this one, and it's going to load. But when you save, you can export it to PDF or PowerPoint. You can export it and turn it into a movie. So if you, I've actually made some movies using keynotes where it basically has a short little piece of text every page with a, a graphic and then I export it and it turns it into a movie. Uh, but a lot of different things you can do with, um, with keynote. And again, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's probably on your machine right now. Um, but that's, uh, keynote I use a lot pages. I don't use as much. Numbers, I don't use at all. And again, the reason why I don't use numbers is the same reason why um, I use Word a lot. Um, Kathleen started using Excel the day it was, was uh, released. And she's a big uh, Excel fan. So I just never got around to using uh, numbers. And having shown you this, there's one more thing I want to show you before I go to uh, questions. And that's something called Simple Note. Simple Note is a text editor that I really, really like. As you can see, I do a lot of things, and each one of these is a new document. Um, but uh, Simple Note is made by the same company that makes uh, WordPress. It's made by Automatic. All of these documents are in the cloud. And you actually write in the cloud. So if I say I want a new note, I say new and I come up here and whatever I type in the top page is going to be the title. Uh, this is a test. And then unlike most text editors, when you write, it's all, it's all text, no formatting, no indents, no hanging indents. It's just text. So when you're writing, it's just pure text. You can have, as, as you saw back here, you can have uh, uh, web links, but really the rest of it is just text. Why is this useful? A lot of people get so hung up on doing formatting that they forget how to write. I had this one college class where the, the, they were divided up into two teams. This one team in one semester managed to complete the cover page, the title page, the credits page, uh, the appendices, 
they never got around to writing the actual document because they were playing around with the formatting so much. And the nice thing about something like simple text, simple note, is that with simple note, all you can write is text. So you just sit there and write. And this is about our trip across country. And um, really, it's just, it's just text. Later on, if I want to add more stuff into it, I will. But uh, it's just text. And because it's stored in the cloud, I can read and write on this from my iPad, from my iPhone, from my Mac. As long as I have an internet connection, I have access to all of this stuff. And yes, you can do the same sort of thing in Google Docs and so on and so forth. But this is a simplified type of writing where I don't have any of that. I, I, I can't center the text, for example. Um, it just, there's no way to do it. So I don't have that distraction. I can just concentrate on the writing part. And I've done a bunch of talking here. So my next step is to ask you, do you have any questions? And have you filled out the attendance form? I have a question. Uh, 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 yes? Question. Yes, Michael? Um, I, I've used uh, both Word at work mostly because no one will, no company will buy um, Apple products. So the, uh, I all exclusively am familiar with Word. But at home, actually, I like Keynote and Pages better. Uh, I'm an engineer, or was a, I'm a retired engineer, and I'm also an algebra tutor. And when I use Pages, the to write an equation into Pages, you have to use LaTeX, and LaTeX puts some just beautiful uh, uh, mathematical symbols and aligns your equations underneath each other. And to do that in Word is oh, I mean they have. Uh, the symbols and everything are in Word, but try to align a picture or something uh, is just murder. And yes, you have to learn LaTeX, but it's very easy. And MacTex actually uh, is a program that's free uh, that writes LaTeX code or lets you write LaTeX code in a very easy way. In fact, it lets you uh, write um, keynote slides as well, and then you can put uh, it, the late Mac text makes a PDF file, and you can cut and paste equations or even the text um, uh, into Pages or Word or or Keynote, uh, and you can then resize it and move it around the page any way you like. Um, and so you don't have a choice in in Pages and Keynote. You have to use LaTeX if you want to put in an equation. So, because uh, I, I, I tried, you know, there's no way to do it. You have to do it. They, it brings up a LaTeX window, and you don't have to use oh, no, oh, MacTeX. Oh, no. And uh, you could just use the LaTeX window that's in uh, Keynote and Pages. But um, that was the only way I found how to, how to write an equation into Keynote and Pages was that way. I, you have my condolences for being a, a recovering engineer, but uh, um, <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that from other people who like using Pages. I, this one guy, he bought a Mac specifically so he could use um, Pages to do his um, uh, mathematics dissertation because he said it was so much easier. There is a plugin that you can use for. Uh, Excel, but he had trouble getting that commercial plugin, which cost like 300 bucks, to match his particular version of uh, Word. And when he moved from one machine to another at to work, it corrupted his uh, dissertation, which torqued him off a lot. Um, so I have heard that too. But uh, uh, most of us don't have to don't have to deal with mathematical <laughs> formula. Um, he was doing a mathematical formula for process control in a chemical plant, which is weird. But um, um, I could not understand his dissertation at all. But he was really happy. Um, any other comments or questions? No other comments or questions? He did. She wrote, 
Uh, were you going to mention Google Docs? Oh, yes. I said I was going to mention Google Docs, and then I didn't. I should do that. Um, and I unless, should... Since we took so much time now, unless you want to do a part uh, two of today. Yeah, but I can squeeze that in because it's, uh, I don't actually have to do anything so much to just show you what it looks like. And to do that, I'll fire up um, Chrome. Chrome? Where are you? Anytime now. I'm streaming video and I'm trying, oh, that's not working. There it goes. Um, Google puts a lot of these things into what they call Google Drive. And if you click on this little plus folder in Google Drive, you can do things like you can create a Google Doc, which is word processing, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Google Forms, and when it says more, Google Drawings, Maps, Sites, uh, Scripts, a bunch of stuff. Uh, but we're going to start with um, the word processing pr uh, portion. The nice thing about Google Docs is that if I type anything at all, as soon as it, sees it, it appears on the screen, it's saved. And it's not saved on my computer, it's saved in the cloud. So I can go to any other computer in the world, go back in here and uh, get it. To title this doc, I just come up here and I say, this is a title. And I get rid of those extra characters. And that's it. It's, it's, it's very, very easy to use. It, you can center things. You can uh, have justified type. You can get bullets. So for example, uh, we turn on bulleting. One, two, three, and one, two, three, four. Um, all the stuff you can in any other word processor. And just like everything else we've talked about, if you say uh, download, you can download as a Microsoft Word document. It'll also download as a PDF or a rich text or a bunch of other things. But uh, I didn't know it did EPUB. That's kind of new. I was going to mention EPUB earlier. Uh, this will, I'll mention it right here. EPUB is the format of documents that you see on your uh, iPad or your phone when you bring it up in, um, in um, what is it? iBooks. Um, the nice thing is that if you have a PDF, a PDF has rigid sides, so an eight and a half by an 11 inch piece of paper, if you save it as a PDF and you look at it on your phone, everything's way too small. If you save it as an EPUB, the text flows to the size of the window. So if you have a small window, it flows it so it fits in there and you can actually read it. And I did not know that they added EPUB as an option which is really cool. Uh, Pages also saves things in EPUB format. But this is, um, this is Google Docs. Google Docs is free. If you have a web browser, go to the web, create a Gmail account, and you have access to um, Google Drive. And I'll show you that. Up here, I'm in my Google Calendar, and you see these buttons right here. Those are other applications that you can use from Google. And to click on that, uh, you can see you can do search, maps, Gmail, calendar, and Drive is where the where all of the um, word processing spreadsheets, so on and so forth, is. So Google Docs is a word processor. Google Sheets is a spreadsheet. One thing about Google Sheets that's worth mentioning, even though we're not talking about spreadsheets, Google spreadsheets are infinite in size. I have created Google Sheets that have a million rows of data which is cool if you have a lot of data. Um, but I wanted to mention that because again, pretty much all of these work the same way that word processors worked um, 20 years ago, except they have a bunch of... Uh, uh, but the advantage is sharing it. Uh, yeah, the advantage is things like Google Docs is also sharing it. Kathleen does things on either uh, Notes on her iPad or in Google uh, Docs, and then she just shares them with me. And she doesn't have to email it or anything like that. She just shares the link and it's mine, uh, which, is, which is cool. Um, we've, I've been on projects where several hundred people were working on the same Google Doc. And we didn't have to do anything special. We just said, you know, here's the doc. And people would go in and, and uh, write on it. Um, 
I, this one policy that we did for the Department of Commerce, I think there were 700 people who signed off on it, which was 695 too many, but it worked. Any other questions? I have two questions for you. Uh-huh. Um, the first one is, you just did something when you were edited, editing text that I haven't been able to do on a Mac, and I want to know how you did it. Now, on a PC or a you know, Windows uh, computer, you can, where your cursor insertion point is, you can delete text to the right of that. Um, when you hit delete here, it deletes it to the left. I want to know how you went deleted text to the right. I will show you. It's this. It's an Apple extended keyboard. Oh. <laughs> the standard keyboard. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, yeah, I'm a writer. I've got something like 1,500, 200,000 publications. I don't, I lost track. And I couldn't stand the fact that I couldn't do a left and a right to leap. And on this, I can. Um, but you, there's also a key combination. I thought, I thought maybe it would, uh, like a, but the there's a key combination that you can use in some programs. You can press Option Delete or Command Delete, and it'll do it'll delete in the other direction. But it's dependent upon the program. Oh. Um, but I couldn't. Okay. I, I I really got this for the delete, but also the numeric key keypad. Um, I my my first job out of grad school, I ran a bookstore, and I can type in numbers like crazy on this keypad without even looking, and not having the keypad just drives me nuts. So, I have an extended keypad, and obviously this is a, a wireless one. Apple wireless uh, key, yeah. keyboard, really quite cool. Uh, that was one thing. Okay, so yeah, the other question was, was Google Docs, is that free or is that uh, a pay item? If you have a uh, Google account, and it can be a Google account for anything, you have access to Google Docs. Um, and okay. if, you have, if you have Gmail, it just, you just look at for that, um, that cl cluster of uh, squares in the upper corner and you can launch those other yep. applications. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Paul? Yes. Okay. Yes, Paul? Uh, you mentioned uh, being able to eliminate your uh, charge return by, yes. by going in and, and removing that particular code. Yes. Okay, first of all, what was the code? Because it was different. It wasn't just CR like one would expect. And where do you find the other codes that are embedded in your in your document so you can do similar okay. magic with it? The three that I can remember because of the ones that I use, they only work with Microsoft Word. And um, they're not currently documented. The reason I know about it is because I've been using Word since 1984 and I memorized them a long time ago. But if you look in Microsoft's Current documentation, there's no mention of these codes at all. But to find a, a, a carriage return, you look for caret p. So think of a think of it as paragraph caret p. To look for a tab, it's caret t for tab caret t. And to look for white space, it's caret w. So the three that are useful are the P for paragraph, T for tab, and W for white space. Um, I have uh, a secretary for a nonprofit who lines up everything with spaces, and it drives me absolutely bonkers. So the first thing I do when she sends me something, I go through and search for all the white space and replace all these strings. When you, when you search for white space, if you have a line that's got 72 spaces in a row, you say search for white space, replace it with a space, you end up with one space. So I don't have to do this 69 times to get rid of the, or 71 times to get rid of all of them. Just search for caret W and it'll and replace it with space and I end up with only one space. That saves a huge amount of time and it keeps me from killing the secretary for this nonprofit who probably 
you know, doesn't deserve to draw and uh, die just because she's driving me crazy. Um, but uh, it's a, a huge time saver. And it's not documented in Microsoft's documentation anymore. It's just, it still works, so I still use it. Any other questions? If there are no questions, I want to tell you what we're going to do next month, because we talked about this the previous month. Uh, next month, I'm not going to talk that much because Kathleen is going to talk about uh, health um, benefits of a, of a Apple Watch. With the uh, new Apple Watch um, operating system, there are a whole bunch of different things you can do with your health and there are some free apps that extend upon that and that's going to be our topic for uh, November. Um, the new Iowa uh, Apple Watch 14, I don't remember what that operating system is, added some um, nice new features and the latest Apple Watch Series 6, I don't know what the latest one is, also has a new feature in it that the watch itself uh, will uh, track your uh, uh, blood oxygenation. Um, and the Apple Watch Series 5 has a fall detector. And I mean, there are a lot of different uh, health related things in Apple Watches. And uh, that's what she's doing for uh, uh, next month. Any other questions? One last question. Um, do you have any idea why uh, they're taking so long to put out Big Sur? Um, do I have any idea why they're taking me to <laughs> Big Sur is um, the largest change in the Apple operating system since they switched from the PowerPC chips to the Intel chips in 2004 or five. I don't remember when they did that. Um, but they're moving to a new chip, the new Apple Silicon chips for future machines. Big Sur will be the first operating system that will work on the current Intel-based machines that we all have now, as well as the um, Apple Silicon machines that they're either going to introduce late this year or sometime next year. So th that is a huge engineering uh, feat. The uh, other thing with Big Sur is that they are adding a bunch of things that they don't currently have. Uh, it'll basically allow you to, if you're a programmer, to much more easily take your iOS apps and port them to the Mac operating system. Uh, you'll be able to download um, a specially revised versions of iOS apps for the Mac. And that may not seem like something that you really care about, but there are over 2 million iOS apps and there are only like, you know, 100,000 Mac apps. So um, that potentially could be a, a huge change especially for things like games. There are a huge number of games for iOS devices and there are relatively few for the Mac. And I can tell just by the audience here that a lot of you are big gamers. Um, but the adding that into the operating system, uh, having support for Apple Silicon as well as the Intel machines, and then the pandemic, you put them all together and it kind of slowed things down a bit. Um, the, uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't think about, especially if you've been a Mac user forever like I have, is that while I think Macs are really important, there are over 2 billion iOS devices. Uh, iOS really is Apple's um, chief focus now. That's their main revenue stream. And so getting the iOS 14 out was, was uh, a higher priority than getting Big Sur out. But for Apple's future, they need to maintain a healthy Mac ecosystem. They want to move to Apple Silicon. They'll be able to use the same processors on, not the same processor, the same kind of processor on their, everything from the Apple Watch to Apple TV to the Mac will all use the same family of processors. Um, so that's, that's their um, big challenge. Then there's also, somebody came up with a really, really, really interesting hack for the security chip that they use in some of the new machines, the, the T2 chip that they use for security on some of the Macs. Uh, somebody came up with a very clever hack. It's almost impossible to execute. Somebody needs physical access to your machine for several hours. 
in order for it to for them to gain access. And even then, they probably don't get anything useful. But um, because that hack exists, I'm sure that Apple's making revisions to Big Sur to basically kill it before it starts. Uh, and I think all of these have slowed it down. But principally, it's the move to Apple Silicon and the pandemic uh, have slowed things down. Um, if you, the Apple keynote that they had last week, or any of them that they've done this week, you can actually see them on your Apple TV or go to the Apple site and, and look at them. And they were basically shot at a uh, deserted Apple campus. Um, you've seen, you might have seen pictures of the keynotes before where the auditorium's just packed. When uh, Tim Cook stood on stage to make the announcements this week, he was the only person in the theater. Even the camera was operated remotely. So um, the pandemic has slowed them down a bit. Um, so that's why it's not out yet. The October special event was not. Do you think there'll be a beta 11? Do you think there'll be an 11th beta? I really, I, that's something I, I can't legally answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, um, the uh, special event this week, this month for uh, uh, October was only announced a week in advance. There is a possibility there might be one in November or they might just release it. It's not unusual for Apple to just release a Mac operating system with little to no warning. Um, but I'm hoping it's reasonably soon because there's a trick I want to do with it that I can't do with, um, with uh, Catalina. And I really, really, really want to do this trick. It, it has to do with, with making fun of my brother in Virginia. So uh, it's not necessarily a really important trick. It's just, it's important to me. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, I will see you next month. And Kathleen is going to talk about the Apple Watch. All right. Good night. Right. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yep. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.